Hi, I'm Barb Oakley, and this episode is about heat engines. What are heat engines? Well, in some sense, they take heat, disorganized energy, with lots of entropy, and turn it into work, something organized that we can get something useful from. So let's take a sort of bird's eye overview of what's going on in a heat engine, and then we'll actually look at a combustion engine in my kitchen. So we can think of this as something like a hot reservoir, hot reservoir, and that can be any kind of really, really area we're getting heat out of. And what we do with a heat engine is we take some of that energy and we're going to let it pour off into the cold reservoir. Okay, so you can think of this almost as the energy that's coming out of the muffler of a car. So our engine is actually taking heat out of the hot reservoir and dumping some of it into the cold re reservoir. So we'll say this is minus QH. What does QH stand for? Well, the hot heat in some in in some uh, sense, and this is at a temperature we'll call th, which means the high temperature, the hot temperature. So we're taking some heat out, and we're converting part of that heat into work. So we'll call that work coming out here, and we throw a little bit of heat away. QC into the cold reservoir. So this is like taking really hot heat from the combustion processes themselves, taking some out as work, and then throwing the rest away through the muffler. Now you may say, well, why do we have to throw this some of this heat away? Can't we just take all of the disorganized energy and make it into something organized? But here's the trick. Don't we have to expend energy to make it organized, right? If it's all unorganized and it becomes organized, we, we've got to do more work on it. So what the upshot of that all is, is we have to, if we want to take energy that's disorganized, in other words, high entropy energy, and make it into something organized, low entropy energy, well, we have to pay the piper. We have to make sure that overall this reaction actually creates a little more disorder than it started with. So we're going to talk about that later, but here it's very clear, I think, that we have a minus QH, right? Here's your minus QH, and that has got to be equal to, well, the QC, And we're going to say that it's also equal to the work, right? Because what goes out, in this case, flows out over here. So it's like one big river. you got a big river here. It divides into two different parts. And you can clearly see minus QH is equal to QC plus W. Now, there's one more relationship, just as we saw earlier for refrigerators. And that is that the work is equal to minus QH times TH minus TC over TH. So this is a little bit of a different set of equations than the ones we saw for the refrigerator, but they work in much the same way. What this really means is the, this is the temperature difference between the hot and the cold reservoirs. The greater the temperature difference between the hot and the cold reservoirs, the bigger this number is going to be. It's going to be a bigger fraction of heat that you can divert and turn into work. And that's all that means. So again, what we're doing here is we're taking heat out, we're siphoning off some of it as work, and we're throwing the rest away. 
This is a video from my favorite website, How Stuff Works. And you can see the layout here where they tell all the different parts related to an engine and how they can be seen here on this diagram. Now, I can click here to activate, to animate it. And you can see it's moving through the four cycles of the engine. First, intake, green, compression, combustion, and exhaust. So intake, you can see it's coming in now. OK, power and out. OK, in, compression, combustion, and exhaust. This shows clearly how the cycle works. And I'll let you watch it for a moment or two more here. You can always go to the website itself on how stuff works. and and take a look at the animation. And this video is to help you gain an understanding of how an internal combustion engine and its components work. The engine we're going to be using is a Briggs & Stratton one-cylinder 5.5 horsepower engine. An engine platform like this can frequently be found on garden tillers, lawn mowers, and even go-karts. The specific design has a horizontal drive shaft. So you can see that right here. This one is used for applications like a garden tiller. This is the exhaust heat shield. I'm going to take that off. and You can see the muffler right here. That's the muffler. Here's the gas tank. Okay, I'm going to make the last little quick disconnection. You can see here's the fuel line to the, from the gas tank going off towards the engine. Here is the carburetor right here. So it's going into the carburetor. Here's the air filter. And, of course, I've taken this cover for the carburetor off. And so now we can kind of begin seeing what's going on here. Here's the horizontal crankshaft here, and here is the crank case that houses the crankshaft. Here we have the cylinder assembly that's right here, and it's got some cooling fins to allow the heat to escape from the engine. Here is, it, within this cylinder assembly, the piston moves up and down. The cylinder head assembly, that's this part right here, houses the intake and exhaust valve. It, too, has these cooling fins. When the engine's running, the spark plug provides a spark that ignites an air-fuel mixture, creating power that is transmitted to the crankshaft via the piston and connecting rod. These are the intake and the exhaust valve rocker arm assemblies right here. The valve by the carburetor, and remember, here's the carburetor right here, so here's the valve that's closest to that. That's this part right in here. Now watch, I'm going to try and press this down. Notice I can press it down a little bit, it's pretty hard. And the valve by the exhaust, notice, here's the exhaust, is the exhaust valve. The rocker arm assemblies here are actuated by rods that are in turn actuated by a camshaft deep within the engine. The result is that these valves are opened and closed, each at the correct time to complete that four-stroke combustion process. So again, as this engine runs, utilizing the four-stroke process, intake, compression, power, and exhaust, that continuously repeats while the engine is running. Now I'm going to remove the cylinder head assembly. Got it all disconnected here. You can see the push rod fell off. Okay. This is the inside of the cylinder head right here. That's the basis. This is the combustion chamber, sort of the top of that combustion chamber. You can see here's the intake valve, sort of the inside of that. Here's the outside of it on this side, intake. And notice it's a little bit larger than the exhaust valve, which is fairly typical. Okay, I'm going to press a little bit so you can see. It's a little hard for me, but you can see how I can press, and that intake valve opens up. 
and that's part, of course, of the entire process of those, those four strokes of the engine. Here's the piston within the cylinder, and I'm going to show you now how the piston moves up and down. So when the piston's at the top, well, right where it was before, as it goes down, it creates the intake. So as that piston comes back up, it's the compression stroke. Next, on its way down, it's the power stroke. And then finally, it's up again for the exhaust stroke. Okay, so here we go. We've got my partially disassembled lawnmower engine here before us. I hope this has given you a better sense of how an engine works. The internal combustion engine was invented by German engineer Nicholas August Otto, and that's Otto spelled like this, in 1867. So an internal combustion engine burns fuel directly in the engine itself. Let's go quickly back over what we just saw. Okay, so here we go. We've got our piston and cylinder. So here we go. Pistons up. Top dead center. Comes back down right here. When it's, well here's our, let's draw this in red. Okay, here's our spark plug, right? So that's right there. And what happens is when that valve opens, and you're going to see that valve opening later on, see it pushes down like this, and then fuel-air mixture comes in as this is drawn down. So this is called the intake stroke. stroke. Intake stroke. And that's when fuel and air enter the cylinder. Okay. Now, this is going to be the same piston here and cylinder. It's just going to be at a slightly later moment in time. So it's not like I'm drawing four cylinders of a four cylinder in engine or something like that. Okay, so now what we've got is it's come all the way down. Each of these valves is closed. Valves closed. Here we go. There's our spark plug right there. And now begins the compression stroke. So here we go, compression. And what that does is it squeezes the mixture, that fuel-air mixture, mixture into a small volume. Okay, then next, there's four different stages here. So next, it's come back, it's come all the way back up. So this is the later stage in time. And now we're about to have the power stroke. Okay, so it's come all the way back up. And we've got those valves are still closed, right? Closed. And here we go, power. So what's happening there is the spark plug ignites the mixture and the hot gas does its work on the car. So that's the power stroke. So let's circle each one of these because later I will probably ask you questions like what are the four strokes of an automobile engine. This is the power stroke and then lastly after all that work we're exhausted. So we're here and we're going to come back up as the exhaust stroke. And for the exhaust, 
this valve opens the exhaust valve obviously and look when it pushes up here it's it's actually pushing there's well it's a little hard to show let's see if I can get my eraser to work properly Come on eraser okay it's probably gonna erase the whole thing ah yes but that's okay so we'll go like that and well now this one that's the intake valve is obviously closed and we want the gas to go out here through the exhaust and that's what actually happens as this piston pushes the gases up and out. Sometimes mechanics will say um, there's a mnemonic which is ICPE and that stands for intake compression power and exhaust but it also stands for I can't please everyone and that works pretty well. Automobiles usually have four or more cylinders so here's these cylinders see and this is one cylinder shown at four different times but automobiles usually have four different ones and we'll see that in some of our videos. Each cylinder is a separate energy source closed at one end just like this one is and equipped with a movable piston several valves right our two valves a fuel injector and a spark plug now remember when the spark ignites here in the power stroke in fact I'm going to show that sort of as this little igniting if we want to maximize our fuel efficiency that internal combustion engine must have the hottest possible burned gas right here and that will let that gas do as much work as it possibly can on this piston to push it down remember high pressure high temperature so it'll push harder it will release the gas what you want it to do is release that gas at the lowest possible temperature so that's a very hot engine releasing at a very cold temperature will give you the most efficient en uh, engine possible that is if you design everything else all right so during that power stroke why can't the burning gas just expand and cool as it's expanding until it reaches the temperature of the outdoor air well there's a problem if you did that the exhaust gas would leave the engine with the same amount of thermal energy it had when it came into the engine so the engine would have extracted all of that fuels chemical energy as work so it would have taken all of this hot heat in other words and extracted it all as work nothing would be left over here nothing would flow into the cold reservoir that would violate the second law of thermodynamics in other words this whole system would not be creating more disorder and as it turns out everything all processes must eventually create more disorder everywhere even though in some places they can create locally little pieces of more order so what this means for us is the heat that comes out of the muffler must always always be hot there's no choice on that so we know we waste some energy inevitably because of the second law but we also waste energy because some heat will escape from the cylinder so heat leaks from the burn gas um, to the cylinder walls and then it's removed by that car's cooling system so this isn't available to this heat isn't available to help produce the work overall the real a real internal combustion engine converts only about 20 to 30 20 percent to 30 percent of that fuels chemical potential energy potential energy to work amazing isn't it not very efficient but 
There's really not much we can do about most of this. Now let's go back here and work a problem. If you take a look here, so let's say our hot temperature is 350 degrees Kelvin and our cold reservoir, that's Tc for cold, is only at 250 degrees Kelvin. If we were taking 100 joules of heat out of the hot reservoir, how much of this could we convert into work? Well, this equation tells us. Let's plug some numbers in here. TH is 350, so we'll write 350. TC is 250, so we'll write that. And we're dividing it by TH, which is 350. And then we'll multiply this by minus QH, which we've already, I just said, heck, it's 100 joules. So what do we get out of it? Well, if you look, this fraction turns into about 0.29 right there. So we're going to take 0.29 times 100 joules, actually. And when we multiply that all out, that, of course, just gives us 29 joules. So we take 100 joules of heat out, and we can only turn that into 29 joules of work. Why? Because of the laws of thermodynamics. This relationship always holds, holds true. This is the best we can do. So let's, let's just carry this a little further. If this is 29 joules, well, both of these things together have to add to 100, so this clearly has to be 71 joules here. Look at that. We're taking heat out and we're throwing most of it away. And there's nothing else we can do about it. Or is there? Is there a more efficient way that we can run this engine? As it turns out, there is something we can do. Let's try a trick. Instead of TH being at 350 Kelvin, why don't we take it way up there? Let's make it be hmm, 550, 550 Kelvin. So we're going to cross that out and we're going to make that be 550. We can allow TC to be the same. Okay, so now we're going to have, now it's the same, I'm going to plug into the same equation. So I'll, I'll draw a little arrow so you can see I'm doing the same thing again. First we'll have TH. TH is 550, and then we're doing minus 250, all over 550, right, because that's what that TH is. And we're going to have 100 joules again, because that's, we're going to take out 100 joules. We have just agreed on this by fiat. Okay, so now what does this turn out to be? Well, this is actually 0.55 here, as opposed to earlier, we had 0.29. So we're going to take 0.55 times 100 joules, okay, and what do we end up with this time? We're going to have 55 joules. Ah, so what this tells us is the hotter we make our hot reservoir in our engine, the more efficient it will be the more energy we'll be able to get out of it. Now, if you want to obtain the hottest possible burned gas, then what you want to have happen is that that compression stroke, right, right in here, you want to squeeze up and have this space be as tight and as small a volume as you possibly can. The more tightly that piston compresses the mixture, the higher its density, temperature, and pressure will be before the ignition, and the hotter the burned gases will be after ignition. So, since the efficiency of any heat engine increases as the temperature of its hot object increases, and since the hot burned gas is that engine's hot object, that's, the, that's sort of like the 
HTH, hot reservoir, then its high temperature after ignition is good for efficiency. The volume at the very beginning, before it starts compressing, as opposed to that at the very end, is called the compression ratio. The bigger the compression ratio, the hotter the burned gas and the more energy efficient the engine is going to be. So normal compression ratios are between maybe 8 to 1 or perhaps 12 to 1. But those in high compression engines may be as much as 15 to 1. You can't make these compression ratios arbitrarily large though. I mean you can't just start with something big and make it teeny tiny in here. And the reason for that is that if the engine compresses the fuel air mixture too much, the flammable mixture becomes so hot that it can ignite all by itself. So this spontaneous ignition due to over compression is called pre-ignition or we usually refer to it as knocking. When an automobile knocks, the gasoline burns before the engine is ready to extract work from it, and so you waste a lot of energy that way. I remember my father having a lot of trouble when we'd pull our trailer up, up big mountains in the old days with knocking. Nowadays, with modern fuel injection techniques, however, there's there's excellent mixing and that allows the cars to computer to to adjust the fuel air mixture so you have complete combustion and minimal pollution so unless your car is seriously out of tune there isn't much room for improvement as far as mixture uniformity is concerned nowadays the other thing you can do though is you can use the most appropriate fuel so if you take a look at this table down here you can see Different fuels burn at different temperatures. 90, the higher the octane number, the higher the temperature it's going to burn at. You want to select a fuel that's able to tolerate your car's compression process without igniting spontaneously. So that's what happens when you purchase the proper grade of gasoline. Regular gasoline right here burns at a relatively low temperature. It's most susceptible to knocking premium gas up here, or down here, ignites at a relatively high temperature. It's the one that's most resistant to knocking. Now a little bit of knocking when you have really tough circumstances, well that's quite alright. Most modern well-tuned automobiles work quite nicely on regular, autom or regular gasoline since only high performance cars with high, pressure engines, uh, high compression engines need premium gasoline. Putting, th putting anything other than regular gasoline in a normal car is usually just a waste of money. Isn't that cool? This is your basic potato cannon. If you've never seen one before, here's the deal. It's a big gun that shoots potatoes. With a potato cannon, we can learn the most important thing about engines, combustion. Let's take a look at how you fire this thing. Step one is to load our potato projectile. So we just stick it into the barrel and ram it down. Step two is to take off the back, and that will let you see the spark producer that we're using here. You can see that when you turn this knob, you get a nice fat spark. Step three is to load the fuel. There's all kinds of fuels we could use. Gasoline, diesel fuel, even hairspray works as a fuel. We put the back back on, and then step four is to aim and fire. The potato weighs about a quarter of a pound and the tiniest bit of gasoline is shooting it hundreds of feet. This is the key thing to understand about engines. The smallest drop of gasoline contains an amazing amount of energy. You can see where all that energy comes from if you think about what's happening. 
We are igniting gasoline molecules. Here's one now. It's made of nine carbon atoms and 20 hydrogen atoms. When it ignites, it takes oxygen from the air, and this single molecule turns into 19 molecules. The mass increases by a factor of 10, and it gives off a ton of heat. The expanding gas generates a lot of pressure. The effect is spectacular. A burst of hot, high-pressure gas blasts the potato out with incredible force. Now here's the thing. What if we use a piston instead of the potato? And what if we attach a crankshaft to the piston? And what if we continuously reload and fire that cannon? Then what we have is the basics of an internal combustion engine like you find in a car. Basically, your car's engine is a highly modified potato cannon. Of course, a real engine like this tractor engine is a little more complicated than that. For one thing, it's made out of metal so that it lasts hundreds of thousands of miles. For another, it needs a precise fuel system so it doesn't waste gas. It produces a ton of heat, so you need big radiators to eliminate all of it. But an internal combustion engine is still pretty simple when you look inside. Imagine that you're an air molecule passing through an engine. The first thing you hit is the air filter to take out any dirt. Then you shoot down this tube called the intake manifold. A fuel injector squirts in a little fuel. Then you wait for this valve to open. It's called the intake valve. As soon as it opens, you get sucked into the cylinder. The piston then compresses the air and gas, and the spark plug fires. The gas ignites. The piston goes flying the other way from the force, just like a potato cannon. Then the exhaust valve opens. You fly out of the cylinder, go down this exhaust pipe to the catalytic converter, then through the muffler to quiet things down and out the tailpipe. Like I said, an engine looks a lot like a potato cannon. What about a jet engine? A jet engine uses the exact same effect, but differently. A jet engine mixes gasoline with air and burns it, but there is no piston. Instead, the thrust of that expanding gas pushes the jet engine forward. What about a rocket engine? It's the same as a jet, except for one thing. Because a rocket engine operates in space, there is no air to supply the oxygen. So a rocket engine carries the oxygen with it in a tank. You have a fuel tank plus an oxygen tank. You mix the fuel and oxygen together, burn it, and get thrust. You can see that all these different kinds of engines use the same basic principle. They mix a fuel, like gasoline, with oxygen. The oxygen either comes from the air or it comes from an oxygen tank. When you light the gas, it creates this huge expansion, and that expansion provides the power. An engine is all about the expansion of hot gases. Nice. I'm Marshall Brain, and that's how stuff works.